What's going on Goombas? My name is Michael James. I'm a published author and self-employed writing coach and today I have a special author interview for you guys. We'll be talking to Matt Batten, author of Dark and the Boy in the Hole, which will be April 10th. Uh, and I'm really excited for him. We're going to be talking about different things like his outlining process, the way he writes, um, why he writes, different things that inspire him, and he's going to be sharing some tips and tricks on how to write for those who are aspiring authors. So I hope you guys enjoy, and uh, let's get right into the interview. Uh, welcome, Matt Batten. This is the author of Dark and the Boy in the Hole. Uh, his book comes out April 10th, 2024. And uh, yeah, before we have Matt introduce himself, I have some rapid fire questions I want to ask him. So Matt, give us a favorite book or a recent read that you've had. Uh, favorite book of all time, Alice in Wonderland uh, by Lewis Carroll, classic. Um, recent read was a collection of short stories called 19 Claws and a Blackbird by Agustina Basterica. Um, yeah, very, very South American writer that's been translated and some interesting kind of story approaches, interesting narratives. Very cool. Haven't heard of that one. I'll have to add that one to my uh, my very long to be read list. <laughs> uh, next question: Your favorite part of the writing process? Oh, so many, so many. Um, plotting out the narrative arc, yes. Picturing the scenes in my head as I write them out. Uh, very visual kind of person because of my screenwriting. Um, but I think it's when you nail a particular line that has a sort of power mm. that you give yourself chills. Oh, when you yes. kind of just, you just bash out a line, even when you go back and read your manuscript, read your, your finished book afterwards, you get to that page, you really go, oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly how you how, uh, what you mean there, because there, there have definitely been times where I'll be writing a scene and like, especially if I'm struggling with a scene and then I come to with just one line that I just nailed it. And I'm like, oh, yes, like finally, like I got something going. <laughs> yeah. Why can't they all be like that? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and then... What is a favorite hobby you have outside of writing? Um, uh, I love I love watching movies um, and you know blockbuster style TV shows. Um, I find them very inspirational. Um, I've always had a fascination. For it. It's what I wanted to do as a career: has be involved in in movies and filmmaking and so forth. Just never had the opportunity. It's... Yeah, very cool. And then lastly, coffee or tea? Tea. Tea. Do you have never, a specific tea? Be- Never been a coffee drinker, um, and this will sound like a pretentious wanker, but for a while, because um, I lived in London for four and a half years, okay, and discovered tea there from Harrods. And when I got back to Australia, I was actually importing the tea from Harrods because it was that good. Wow! Um, but now I've discovered a new one, which is a French Earl Grey, which has got a kind of vanilla flavor. Delicious. Mm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to. I, I try to like tea. I really do. I want to like tea, but I, I'm a coffee person at heart. But I one wow. tea I do really like is uh it I forget what it's called but it is I think they call it buttermint or something and it's like a, right. a vanilla mint tea and it is so good but other than that I haven't fallen in love with tea yet but maybe I'm maybe I'm having the wrong teas because in America you know maybe uh, we don't have the right tea <laughs> I I have I have one that's a New York uh, breakfast tea that okay. tastes almost like pancakes with maple syrup. Wow. Well, I will I will definitely try that just for you because you mentioned it. <laughs> but all right. So now uh, let's get into um, more of the in- introduction of who Matt Batten is. Uh, tell us about you and tell us about um, your new book, Dark. Um, OK, so look, everyone likes to say they've been a writer since they were a kid and so forth. And and I was, but I also wasn't. Yeah, um, I enjoyed writing in my early teens through school but i didn't realize i I didn't realize it until much later in life i look back and go god i actually really did enjoy doing that um Mm. it wasn't until i hit probably early 20s that i was i was then going oh i've got an idea for a story i'm going to write this story but i did for like 20 years in fits and spurts go from project to project and then put them aside for years and then i have more unfinished novels than probably anybody else but i don't know there's so <laughs> many that i have unfinished um and so i never i never thought myself as being a writer or wanting to be a writer it was it's weird it's now it's like i could never acknowledge that that's what i wanted to do mm. um and then it was probably about only 10 or well, about 10 years ago I started a whole new story 
And this one, for some reason, just captivated me. And I think probably even just my maturity in life, my experience, just kind of went, yeah, this is this is something that can go somewhere. Um, but then put it aside for, you know, seven, eight years or more um, and until COVID hit. And then when, you know, I found myself with plenty of time up my sleeves for COVID, was able to open it up and actually really get stuck into it and approach it properly, mm. like actually sit down and, be, and become a writer. Um, and so, yeah, that was it's probably only in the recent, you know, three, four years that I've mm. actually really focused on writing, despite the fact that even, even when I found a box of old school books from when I was a child, um, this is going to make me sound like I'm really old, um, <laughs> I found one from when I was age seven and inside the back cover was a poem I'd written at the age of seven. Wow. And I read it. It was, only, it was only two lines and it was the boy through, uh, what was it? The boy threw the coin in the wishing well and it went right down to burning hell. And I thought that's dark for a seven-year-old. Wow. Really interesting as a, as a visual metaphor. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and even that, you know, finding that and kind of going, oh, Maybe I should have acknowledged this sooner. <laughs> yeah, no, I can, I can definitely see that. It's very cool that you uh, found a poem from your childhood because for me, when I started writing, um, I had a, a good friend of mine passed away and I wrote a poem. I had to write a poem uh, for school, but I decided I was going to, uh, and, and this was now my, my uh, reason to write the poem, was to dedicate it to his life and his passing. So I wrote a poem in honor of that. And it got a bunch of recognition, and that's when I was like, "Huh, maybe I maybe I have a knack for writing," and I started to fall in love with it. So it's it's very interesting. Yeah. But well, I, th I think the thing for me is I was also I was I've always been a bit of an adept artist, painting mm. and drawing, and so my parents would see that, and that was kind of what they would kind of you know foster for what of a better word you know kind of you know push me yeah you do more drawings, and so and so I, I followed art as a as a as a vocation, um, even as a university degree, yeah. um, even in my career in advertising, very much in terms of the art space, an art director, a creative in that space. Oh, um, so, cool. so I was always visual. And I think that made me put aside this hidden, latent, wanting desire to, to write. Yeah, yeah, I can I can definitely see that. Like, I, I hear a lot of people say that when they talk about how they got into writing, especially people that came into it a little later, They they always say, you know, I, I thought I had another passion and another career and not saying that visuals is not a passion you have, but um, it almost it almost hindered you from realizing like, man, I should have started writing sooner, you know, yeah. but yeah. no, that, that's very cool. And if I correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you said that you did the cover of Dark, correct? I did. I've done all the artwork. I mean, oh, again, so cool. using using my, my skills in design and art, um, as well as, you know, from my skills in a career in advertising and design, I'd be able to professionally lay out the interior of the book. Um, yeah. yeah. So this is, uh, for all the readers and uh, viewers out there, this is a cover of Dark, and I, I received an early copy. The book doesn't come out, as I said, till April 10th, but I have been tirelessly reading it this week, and I'm almost done. I actually have... I think less than 100 pages left. I got like maybe 60, 70 pages left. I just got to, uh, I believe, chapter 30 or 31. Um, and I, I've been loving it. And it, it's interesting because I, so outside of my client work, I don't read a ton of fantasy. I, I've read a few fantasy books here and there, but I I probably grew up reading more fantasy than I read now. But um, for the people that I work with, fantasy is like this huge booming genre right now. And so I work with a lot of people that write in fantasy. So uh, a lot of times when I'm working with fantasy, it's almost like uh, I'm I'm not reading it for fun necessarily. I'm reading it more for because I have to. Um, where this was like the first fantasy book that I'm reading for fun in a long time. And it was really, uh, uh, it's just so exciting. I've actually loved it. I feel like one of the big problems that a lot of fantasy writers have is uh, having way too much backstory or not not mixing it in with the uh, events that are going on in the story relevant to the time of the book. And I feel like you nailed it with your book. Like, I feel like there, there definitely is backstory. There's definitely still the training. There's still the explanations of how this world operates, but it is woven so well with the story that's going on. And I, I absolutely love it, especially the first chapter is so interesting how we start with dark in this hole. And it's like, it, it, like just the way it started, I was like, I have to read that again. Like it, it just really caught me. I really loved it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Look, you're, you're 
30, 31 um, chapter is what you're on. Uh, yes, you're yes. only like you're 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 right at the turning point. Yes, you I are think seriously I'm at, right. At, yes, I'm at chapter thirty, the prize. The prize, yeah. So you are you are probably yeah one two chapters away from the massive turning point. Yeah, I just got to the part where I won't spoil too much, but I got to the part <laughs> where there has been a twist in the story and some people have been bamboozled i'll just say that but uh <laughs> so now we'll see what happens next and i really wanted to keep reading but had an interview yeah. <laughs> but... well let's stop this now you <laughs> we'll spend yeah. the next 40 minutes you just reading the book no uh, i think and look about the the world building i've because i'm a i love fantasy yeah. and I've, I struggle sometimes with, I mean, they call it high fantasy or epic fantasy mm -hmm. versus low fantasy. A couple of my writer friends, again, you know, I found on threads, they hate, the like me, hate the term low fantasy because it diminishes it. Mm. But I think what we're really talking about is how forced the world building is versus yes. how you let it unfold within the story. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do struggle sometimes with epic fantasy and, you know, J.R. Tolkien was the 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 guy who started it, right? He he created this as as a genre essentially, and while The Hobbit was probably the book that really got me into reading, mm -hmm. um, and this up there was in my list of favorites. When I tried to do Lord of the Rings, there was there's just pages and pages and pages. Going, just get on with it, yeah. Just get on with it, Wiz. Um, and so I think it does get in the way sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but trust me, this is the the first in a planned series. The world will continue to unfold. Little snippets and stuff there, little breadcrumbs will be will be revealed later. Yeah, I I've been really enjoying it. I think uh, I think one of my favorite things about the story thus far is the intricate details between just having like because um, again, not trying to spoil too much, but just having your your character like who has not really been outside of this hole for much of his life or at all he, yeah. he he's like learning new little things about the world around him and it's it's almost like seeing life through the innocence of a child's eyes like and it, it causes you even to just take a step back in your own life and be like man what was the last time i appreciated the, the beauty of the sky the beauty of the the trees and the rocks around me and, and just like the beauty of like the creation around me like we don't we don't take a moment just to appreciate that enough and seeing seeing the book through this child's eyes, like really just caused me to feel like a child myself, like reading it. Like I really, I really enjoyed it. Like honest to God. Excellent. Excellent. Cause that is, that is what I'm going for, right? Yeah. Going for how do you take naive innocence where it's a completely blank slate right. and thrust it into this world that has no meat, has no reasoning, no meaning, um, almost no goodness in it mm. and how does he how does he navigate that and find out who he is but also find out what he wants to be and obviously right. there's the decision that he has to make of what he wants to be um and it's it's an anti-hero story yeah so how do you how do you have him side with what would normally be the evil normally be the monsters of the story how do you mm. have him side with those and be up against humanity where humanity is you know, reflecting from our real world, humanity yeah. is the worst thing to ever happen to this planet. And and it's so interesting because, like, even uh, even you talking about it, it's such a, uh, it's almost like it's very uh, naive in the sense that this is from a child's perspective. But at the same time, this is very much like still a conflict that an adult can relate to. Like, this isn't this isn't your typical like YA fa fantasy uh, novel. Like, I feel like anyone from any age could really relate with this and, and enjoy it, which I, which I really appreciate because I feel like sometimes things are either far too advanced on one way uh, or on the other end, they're, they're way too dumbed down and I can't always relate with them as well. But I feel like this yeah. is like perfect middle ground. Like I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. And that was, that was actually one of the major intents behind it as well of the, that a lot of the MG mm -hmm. um, books they tend to do that. They tend to dumb it down, make it safer. And kids are a lot more, you know, dark and interested in in, in things than writers or the, the publishing industry would would take them to, to be. Right. And so absolutely. I wanted to take I want to take essentially what could be the Harry Potter story, mm -hmm. but absolutely make it dark. How do you make it so it really is yeah. about all the bad shit in the world? Yeah. Um, without going so far that you have parents be terrified that their child is reading this, mm -hmm. but also make it relate to adults. And, that, and 
at the center of it all, the child is actually me. Mm. It's actually, so I don't know if you're aware of this, but you probably, probably because I've touched on it every now and then. Um, I don't talk too much about it, but a late realization in life that I am actually neurodivergent. Mm. Um, you know, what I would call highly functioning <laughs> autism spectrum. Um, lots of little quirks and so forth. And people say, oh, but that's not really it. No, it is. The big thing for me is estrangement. I never feel like I've fitted into places. Mm. I never feel like I belong, you know, even amongst friends, sometimes family. I, I don't belong there. I feel like I'm always the outsider. And so that's what this central character is, somebody who is always on the outside and doesn't belong into any place. Even when they think they've found their place, they still don't belong there. Yeah, yeah. And so I in, that I sense, in that sense, they relate to kids who feel that way, but also adults like myself. Yeah, I I could definitely see that. And throughout the narrative, like there's different times where our main character comes to places where he feels like he's found like meaning, like he, fa he found like, finally, this is what I can call home. And then someone questions him again. And it's like, can you call this home? And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, and then he tries another place. And it's like, this isn't home either. I don't like this. I thought I'd like this and it's not what I want. <laughs> so, yeah. but yeah, that's, that's definitely um, a common theme in your story and I'm really enjoying it. Um, but, uh, so let's, let's uh, move forward. Let's uh, talk about your creative, uh, your creative process. Um, do you have a, you, you mentioned that you really like uh, movies. Do you have any specific movies that um, maybe inspired you to write more or, uh, different different script writers or different uh, movies that you feel like you can pull from to get your inspiration? Um, favorite author is Terry Pratchett. Mm -hmm. um, the entire Discord series is absolute genius. Um, How I many was, books is that? Uh, oh, it's nearly 50. Yeah, it's so many books in that series. Yeah. So, if, so even when I talk about it, people go, oh, I never picked that up. I should read which one. It's like... It's a it's a big thing you're going for here, right? Because mm -hmm. you're now gonna catch up and you're gonna read from the first one all the way through. Yeah. But it is it is genius in how mm -hmm. he perfectly mixes fantasy with that the total world building fantasy with comedy. It is hilarious in, in many parts, but also with every book has some kind of moral story, some mm -hmm. kind of ethics to it. Um, and even you could you could tell where he'd been in his life based on the books that he'd come out, he'd, he'd publish. And I, I actually was lucky enough to meet him twice. Oh, and that's so cool. Yeah, on his first trip to Australia, it was only like a year later, the next book um, was all about a random country found at the far end of the world that has indigenous Aboriginals and so forth. And you're like, yes, because you came to Australia and you're inspired, but you suddenly realize there's a whole, there's a whole new thing you can add to your, your Discord universe. Oh, that is um, so cool. Yeah. So he's my favorite, um, it's very inspiring, um, and not just as a writer, but as, as, a, as a person. Mm -hmm. um, and my favorite, favorite thing he ever did, and for those who don't know, within the Discworld series, uh, one of the characters he had, a recurring character, was Death, the Grim Reaper. And Death always spoke in all caps. Hmm. Didn't even have quotation marks, speech marks around, it was all caps. And over, over a series of books, you understand that when it's all caps, death is speaking. And it got to the point where he could actually have a scene in which somebody is in a battle and they, they finish and they're standing there and go, yes, that turned out all right. And then there'll be all caps saying, ah, this didn't turn out like you thought. And you realize, oh, death has now just arrived without even him telling his death arrived. Wow. This is not what, this is not what you think it is. So he'd established that. And then when he knew he was quite ill towards the end of his life, he actually set up with his estate, whoever was going to be his, his the manager of his estate, that because he had a massive following on Twitter, he actually set it up so that on the day that he passed away, after it had been announced in the news, there was one final tweet from his account, and it was in all caps saying, welcome, Mr. Pratchett, we meet again kind of thing. Wow, and and, is... knew, and every, all the fans knew, oh, my God, he pulled the ultimate prank. He's done a tweet from beyond the grave of death meeting him. So oh I just find him, his brain is just so inspiring. Um, so, yeah, Terry Pratchett, but also William Goldman. Mm. So famous script writer, but author of Butch Cassidy's Sundance Kid, Marathon Man, and my favorite movie of all time, Princess Bride. Right? Yeah. Princess Bride itself. So many people go, yeah, I love that movie. I suggest you pick up the book. Go mm. get the book and read it, because as much as the movie is kind of a bit meta in terms of there's this fairy tale being told by a grandfather to his son, 
the book goes another layer over that. Wow, I didn't know that. About, yeah, the author talking about how his grandfather told him this story and then he wanted to pass on to his son and then he got the book. It wasn't what he thought it was. And it just it's this layer upon layer upon the Princess Bride story that we will know and love. Man, and it's, it's like so breaking clever. the fourth wall. <laughs> it is. It only breaks the fourth wall. It's so clever. It's no wonder that he became, again, he's passed away now too, no wonder he became one of the best screenwriters in Hollywood. Hmm. And I believe he actually made more money out of the options he had running than the actual books and movies that he had get produced. Wow, that's so, so he, he was known to have so, such good stories that he would be able to option them. And, you know, I don't know, his, his value would probably be half a million dollars a pop for three years mm -hmm. and have all these scripts out there being optioned for three years and never made, but he's just making all this money off these great stories that he's, he's got sitting in the back, back wings. Yeah, I, I heard of that happening with, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've read Save the Cat by Blake Snyder, um, but he mentioned in his book that um, he's, he's sold tons of scripts that never got made. And I was like, yeah. that's so interesting. Like, he, he'll sell, he mentioned one script that he sold for like half a million dollars or something. I, I forget what it was about um, exactly. It had aliens in it and something. But he talked about who bought it and how much they bought it for and how it was this great achievement that he had. And I was... And I looked it up and it wasn't ever made. And I was like, yeah. I can't believe he made all this money off a script that was like, they never even turned into a movie to make their money yeah. back. <laughs> Gold, Goldman have dozens and dozens of them out there all being optioned. And quite often they would be on a three-year basis. Hmm. So if it hadn't been produced within three years, he would get the rights back and then somebody else would option it. And so it's just this ongoing jumping around Man, from that's so interesting. interest of party, interest of party. And a lot of the time they don't get made because... They can't get the investment to mm. do to do it justice. Um, sometimes the timing's not right. They might option a film, and then only six months later, something else comes out that's so close to it that the production companies go, uh, "This this will not work out. It'll look like a copycat." Yeah, yeah. So they just kind of put it on the back burner. But yeah, oh, that's so, so I think Goldman himself again, great stories, but also obviously so talented and wanted, and that's what you want. Yeah. Um, let me see. What... Okay, here we go. So where do where do you think your story ideas come from? Do you think it's more of just kind of brainstorming, like you just start trying to make up a story, or do you have epiphany moments where you're like, oh, that's a great story idea, or is it something else in life? Maybe it's personal events that happen to you, and you're like, now I got to make that into a story. Like, how does it work <laughs> for you? Um, it's it's more, I guess, the epiphany moments, these random sparks, and they're quite often inspired by an observation of the real world around us. Mm. You know, moments in time, um, a lot of there's a, a process I use in my advertising career um, to come up with what is the what they call the big idea. Um, it's called a what if, where you propose this thing that could be impossible to sound ludicrous and then explain how it's actually viable. Mm. So what if this happened or what if that happened? Um, you know, in terms of advertising, it's what if the brand did this? And people go, how could it possibly do that? You go, ah, yeah. here's how it does that. So the similar thing to the stories, right? What, what if? we opened a story where the child is actually just in a pit in the ground for the entire mm. first chapter. And what happens up? Like, you know, it's, it's not saying that's how that happened, but it's like propose the what if and go, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, the, the, the big thing on TV at the moment is three body problem. Okay. Um, it's um, uh, being made by Vice and Benioff who did Game of Thrones. Um, and the big what if for the, because it's from a series of books, the big what if there is, what if there was an alien invasion, but in 400 years? Hmm. If we know it was coming, but it's not happening right now, like Independence Day, we're told we're being invaded in 400 years. Yeah. What would happen to the world? What would, how would Earth react? And so that creates a whole new approach to the alien invasion story. Right, right. I love that because I, I think that's how, that's kind of how I came up with my story um, cause I knew I wanted to write, um, a blackmail story and, but I didn't know what I wanted that premise to be about. And I asked myself the question of what if the guy being blackmailed is actually innocent? And I thought that was just an interesting yeah. concept of like, what if someone was being blackmailed and they didn't even know if they did or didn't do what was yeah. they were being blackmailed for. So yeah, that, that's awesome. Um, is there a certain plot structure that you follow or maybe it's a mix of a few or maybe you have a specific one that uh, really speaks to you that you use? Yeah. Um, when I 
like I said, when a few years ago, when I got back into writing, I actually started by getting into screenwriting mm -hmm. um, rather than going back into trying to write a novel. Um, I think it was to do with the, obviously the inspiration from movies and so forth, but also the visual technique that I have where I'm able to picture what's happening. Um, but also found it far more immediate. You know, mm. it's not like you're trying to write, you know, 120,000 words and 300 pages, yeah. right? A script needs to be a certain length. It needs to be no more than 90 pages long, right, ideally right. 70 pages long. Um, there's a style that you're stripping out all of the the world building and just trying to create the narrative structure using right. some dialogue and some very basic scene descriptions. So I really enjoyed screenwriting. Um, and from that, there's a three-act structure mm -hmm. um, that, you know, is a universal thing. It's not something that's not... People think, it's, oh, it's an invention that we've created for, for writing. It's not. You look back through stories all the way back through time, and right. they all had some kind of three-act structure. So I, I use the three-act structure for writing screenplays, but I've adapted it to what I call the five-act structure for my novels. You know, I'm not the only one who does that. How do you actually mm -hmm. have an extra section within there for, an, for another high point within the story or a low point as needed? Um, and then within that... Um, you know, certainly for Dark and The Boy in the Hole, I use the hero's journey okay. I stretched across those those five acts. But again, my own adapted version of the classic hero's journey to add, to like fit the five acts, but also add extra high points and extra low points. Right. Um, the, the, the thing that I like to go for is, and we, sh as writers, we should learn this from modern media consumption of, mm -hmm. of consumers, TV shows, uh, constructed so that every episode is self-contained within that longer narrative yeah. and finishes on a point that makes you go, oh, I can't wait to see the next one. And that's why we've now got a world of binge watchers yep. where, where a new show comes out and it's meant to go over the course of three months, but we'll smash it in one weekend because every episode is designed to make you want to see the next one. Yeah, That's how I, that's how I approach my writing. Every chapter should be an episode. Every chapter should leave you hanging of what's the next thing. Um, you should always make sure that each chapter is required for the next chapter to exist. And that's what helps that story push through everything. Oh, I love that. I love how you put it, like how every chapter should end with us wanting to read the next one. I heard a, uh, I can't remember who said it, but I was listening to another podcast and I heard another author say that every single line you write should make you want to read the next one and the next yeah. one and the next yeah. one. And when you really boil it down to that, it's like, man, if I made every line that good that it makes me want to read the next one, like, you know, I'd be I'd be a bestseller author, a selling author at this point, you know, but um, but it's it's really important to think of our stories like that, because when you when you structure a story, it's easy to it's easy to want your to let yourself to go off on these tangents and to follow like what if what if dark did this? What if he did that? What if yeah. uh his friends went this way. Like, what would happen if this happened? But, like, we also have to, like, yes, those can be fun scenes that we add, but we also have to contain that within, okay, what is the structure of this story? Yeah. Um, and the uh, the uh, the hero's journey I use uh, loosely in my writing as well. I have, I, I actually have a uh, five-plot structure, same way I call it the, uh, I have my intro, adventure, failure, climax, and conclusion. And then I use the hero's journey within that. And yeah. I have the same thing where I have like, I call it the physical climax, which is like my midpoint climax. And then I have mm -hmm. an emotional climax at the end, which is like the big finale type climax. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, very cool. But the hero's journey doesn't just have to apply to adventures. I, I wrote a, a rom-com screenplay that pretty much follows the hero's journey as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's a pattern that helps to formulate how stories unfold in terms of yes setting up the mc that they don't necessarily have to be dragged into this uh, don't actually have to want to be in this in this narrative arc but they're forced they're compelled to in some way that there's going to be problems there's going to be pitfalls there's going to be something to overcome and even in a rom-com right even thinking about right. your, your favorite rom-com films there's always something to overcome there's always a point at which they think they've they've found their true love but then it all falls apart and they have to right. try and win it back that's a hero's journey yeah i i was just watching uh 
I my wife was what I forget what it's called. It's called like Twenty Seven Dresser or something. It's a it's a rom com. Yeah, yeah. My wife was watching. That's the Catherine Heigl film. Yeah. Yeah, and I I woke up to watching it with her, so I was just like, yeah, I guess I'll I'll keep watching this. And I noticed it even in that. I was like, man, the hero's journey is like like literally in every single scene, and it was it was played out so yeah. so easy for me to follow. But it it was interesting yeah. because like you're saying, like we we oftentimes think of it like uh, our character has to go on a journey, but like. It doesn't have to be an adventure in the sense. It could be an emotional journey. It could be a spiritual yeah. journey of some sort. It could be any type of uh, of journey that we want it to be, depending on how we want to write or tell that story. Um, yeah, I mean, think about think about your favorite Christmas films, right? Um, well, I think about my favorite Christmas between Die Hard and Elf. Yeah, they are both the hero's journey. Yep, yep. Totally yeah. different framework. Totally different narrative. Even totally different genre. But they are both the hero's journey. Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. So we're about halfway through the interview, and before we continue, I had a quick and exciting announcement for you guys. My next book, You've Got the Wrong Guy, is coming out just around the corner, and I'm really excited to share that I am doing a few signed copy giveaways for people that support me. So here's the summary of the book. If you haven't heard, I'm going to read it to you. CJ's past collides with the present when he finds an ominous sticky note on his windshield. Return what you've stolen or else. He says it's a mistake, but as new notes appear and loved ones are hurt, it's clear his blackmailer thinks otherwise. From high-speed chases to breaking and entering, CJ finds himself slipping back into old ways. To make matters worse, his actions lead friends to question his innocence. CJ must decide how far he's willing to go to prove they've got the wrong guy. And uh, I'm really excited to share this story with you guys. I been working on it for the past year or two now and i have a buy me a coffee page if you want to support me in uh publishing this book i there's a there's a lot of things that go into marketing and uh buying bulk orders of the book so that i can uh sell signed copies and to also be able to enter the book into competitions this year so for those who do decide to support me they will be entered into a giveaway for a free signed copy i'll probably do two or three different signed copies that i'll give away for free and then there will also be discounts for signed copies for those who do not win if you would still like to purchase a signed copy from me. And then obviously the book will be available on Amazon. I will keep you guys updated when it is published. It will be in the next few months. So if you're interested in the giveaway and receiving a signed copy of You've Got the Wrong Guy when it publishes, then click the link in my description to support me at my Buy Me a Coffee page. I appreciate all my supporters. There's going to be a lot of stuff over there. Other than giveaways, there's also sneak peeks of the book. I'm doing uh, audio versions of the first four chapters if you want to hear that early. Um, I'm going to be talking about writing over there as well, all kinds of stuff. So uh, go check it out if you want. And uh, yeah, back to the interview. Um, and then do you outline? Do you have an outline of your story before you start writing or outlines of chapters? Or do you just kind of keep it all in your head and then start writing? Or how does that work for you? Um, I'm a plotter. They talk about plotters and pantsers. I'm a plotter. Um, the... I, I, I may get vilified <laughs> for some of this thinking, but I think when you're reading a book, you can tell if it wasn't plotted out. Mm -hmm. You can tell if, or, or it was only kind of half semi-plotted out. Mm -hmm. You can tell when there's that filler fluff going on um, that tends to drag the story, story out, slow it down, slow down the pace. Um, and also in some instances where it feels like the author had to make something up to resolve a, a challenge they'd encountered in the writing process. Right. You know, as you, as you write yourself into a corner, then having to invent something to get out of it rather than going back and going, what was my plot that allowed me to never get written into a corner? So I, I plot. Um, I start by writing out the basic plot, just bullet points. Um, you know, boy in a hole, then let's talk about the king, let's do this, let's do that. So very basic bullet points. Uh, then I expand each of those into a sentence massage them a little bit so I feel like yeah this kind of sounds like it could be a good story but then I put them all on post-it notes and stick them all up on a wall and the post-it notes are color coded um, they're grouped by act um, the color coding is to is a story markers for like the inciting incident the call to arms the challenge point the false hope all that sort of stuff they're stuck up on the wall and it allows me to stand back and actually see the visual narrative as these colored bo blocks and read through it and I I didn't do that to the start of dark i did the writing out each each plot point and then fleshing them out and then and then fleshing them out further as chapters essentially but i did get to a point where i discovered that it wasn't it wasn't going the direction that i thought it would mm. the plot was still there i was still sticking to the plot that i bullet pointed out 
but I'd, I'd found a flaw in the narrative. And so when I sat down and then redid, rejigged those post it notes on the wall, I was going to stand back and go, hang on a minute. For this to happen, this has to happen back here. And that means in this act, there's got to be the setup for the thing that happens in this act mm -hmm. rather than just being thrown upon the audience, which means I need to establish why it happens in the previous act. So you have, that's where you get your subplots happening, your backstories start to emerge. And that allowed me to merge some together, add new ones, throw a couple in the waste paper bin, and then stand back and kind of go, holy shit, it just clicks. Yeah. It absolutely clicks now. Um, and even even doing that, you're, again, don't want to half about the hero's journey. Hero's journey is a, is a guideline. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean you have to stick to it. It, do, it does allow you to kind of go, you know what, I'm going to take this part and this part that are normally steps two and three, and I'm going to swap them around. Yep. Because they're still there in that first section of the, of the hero's journey um, and allows you to have that interesting kind of narrative bent where, you know, it was almost like you're messing with time a little bit, but also it feels like you've gotten ahead. Then they go, ah, yes, that's why that's happening. Yeah. No, I, I yeah, love that. Definitely plotting. Yeah. I uh, I actually do something very similar. So I, I have my – it's funny because I have clients that I work uh, – I write outlines for. And a lot of times um, they'll they'll come to me and be like, why why would you write the outline for me? And I'm like, well, let me see the outline you have first. And they send me something that's just like five or six bullet points. And I'm like, yeah, yeah you you can't just work with this. Like this isn't yeah. this isn't how you write a twenty chapter book or thirty chapter yeah. book. So I always uh, kind of teach how to outline. But one of the things that I talk about is starting with you know you start with your bullet points and then you expand those into sentences, phrases, paragraphs, you know, yeah. however long that takes. And then you can, if you feel like you need to, you can outline specific scenes. You can outline, uh, you know, specific, okay, I don't know the exact scenes that are all going to happen here, but I have, the, you know, an idea for this act, you know. And obviously there's different ways people can go about it. But yeah, I feel I feel like outlines are so important as well. Yeah. And I, I always emphasize to people to make it visual, make it something physical on your wall. Um, and put a cork board up or put up a, a whiteboard and stick things to it so that yeah. you can see and move things around. You can take things off, put new things on, you know, and always, always keep working with your story like that. Because sometimes looking at it on a screen, it, we just can't, can't comprehend as much as we can when we have it physically and we can move things around yeah. and, and watch ourselves moving around. So I, I love that you did that. That's so cool. I did the, even, I did even just applying, oh, I'm sorry, even even just applying a little bit of maths to it, right? If you right. go 80,000 words is roughly 400 pages. Uh, you want a chapter to kind of be 10 to 15 pages. So we're talking mm -hmm. that's going to be about 40 chapters, 30 to 40 chapters. Therefore, I need to have 30 to 40 bullet points in my narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, if we if we think about it in that light, like it, it really puts into perspective how much do I have to figure out for this story to work? Because um, even when I first outlined my story, uh, the way I outline, I, I kind of consider my outline like the first draft. Um, and I when I outlined my story, it was around 10 to 12 pages long of just all these scene ideas. Um, but I'm I'm a very loose outliner. I'll, I'll outline the, the main plot of each section. Um, but then when I write my chapters, I'll, I'll typically have another outline for that chapter. And I'll say, okay, I want it to start here. This is the main problem or conflict of this chapter. And this is where it's going to end. Is it going to be a cliffhanger or are they going to resolve something? And then it'll, will it extend into the next chapter? Like, and then I'll write that chapter and then yeah. I'll look back at my outline. Okay. Did, how far did I get across in this plot point? Um, and I'll keep moving like that. And I actually got to a point in my book where I was about halfway and then I couldn't finish it. And I had to make the physical outline so that I could figure <laughs> out what was going on. But, um, yeah, very cool. Very cool. And, uh, if anyone's watching and you don't make physical plots and physical outlines, you know, give it a try. <laughs> well, if, even when you get, if you, if you do the physical plot and stick it up on your wall, add some character art, right? Yeah. If you've got, if, if you're world building, then, then draft your map and make sure that your characters aren't suddenly jumping distance of leagues in the in this course mm -hmm. of one chapter but in others you know they're taking forever to cross over one particular bridge or something how do you make sure that the the geography fits with the narrative arc and vice versa and sometimes that will change your map that'll change the way the geography is working it might change even the character art as you realize no this guy needs to be bigger and tougher this 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 female mage needs to be scarier 
Yeah, I know for uh, I know for fantasy writers, it is definitely beneficial to have your character sketches, to have your your map uh, sketched out, even if it's not something that you plan on using in your book. Like it helps you visualize what's going on here. Even having tons of backstory written that may never make it into the book, like it is so beneficial for yeah. you to understand, so that you can write the book in order for things to make sense. Um, and then for like, I know a uh, I know a historical fiction writer that they don't use physical maps, but they they make visual timelines where they will have, okay, the book starts in 1820 and ends in 1840. It follows the life of this character, and they plot out in this year, this is what happened, and this year, this is what happened, and it'll be different timelines, one that follows this character, one that follows um, you know, what's going on in the world around them, what's going on in this country, stuff like that, and that helps them, okay, how can I now make a story out of this? Yeah. Yeah, I did have to when I was writing dark. I had to keep because uh, again, for those who don't know, the the child at the center of dark, his unique gift is his ability to mimic any any ability he sees. Yeah, uh, including those of the fantastical creatures and monsters he encounters, and so those abilities obviously become central to him resolving the big challenge. Um, but I had to keep a, a separate sheet that was detailing start off with the powers he would need to have. The creatures that are all borrowed from from mythology and folklore, I haven't yeah. kind of invented. Uh, there's one that I have kind of invented, but the rest are all borrowed from from mythology and folklore. Which so which research, I love, by the way. <laughs> so re research on those creatures. Um, my my home library has got the entire case, all the bookcases, all about mythology and, and and that sort of stuff, and folklore. So researching the creatures and finding this is the creature that has this particular ability in his folklore that he can learn to use in this particular instance. But as I was writing it, I had to jot down, he now has this ability. And then two chapters later, he's now picked up this ability just right. to make sure he wasn't jumping ahead. He mm -hmm. wasn't trying to do things he wasn't capable of doing at that point in time, but also building up to being the awesome power he is at the end. Yeah, I, I actually really enjoy where there have been a few chapters where he doesn't figure out a, an ability right away and it's like and he gets frustrated he's like why can't i do this like yeah. and and i love that because it's not like everything just comes easy like you do have uh chapters where he has to practice different things and and make sure he's still able to do something or he'll he'll be able to do it a little bit but he can't do it all the way and um yeah. i think that's really important just because like it helps us kind of develop with this character and see that you know like he's growing just like you know like anyone is you know yeah yeah that's also it's also i mean some of them come a little bit more naturally some mm -hmm. he doesn't try he just you know goes well i saw this happen so i'll give it a go and then he's able to do it yeah um others yeah he tries and tries and tries and cut and there's one in particular he's unable to do for a mm -hmm. very good reason that you'll encounter later on yeah no that's super awesome um about your uh, writing process, which this can be when you were writing dark or even now if you're <laughs> writing something else, but how do you, how is your writing process? Do you have a specific daily routine or a specific goal? Is it something that's over a week or is it over every single day? Um, how, how does that work? I've, I've tried daily goals. I, I do love the idea of sitting down and making sure you get at least a thousand words or five mm. pages or whatever it is. Like, I think people setting themselves micro goals like that is really beneficial. Challenge is I've got a, I've got a family, mm -hmm. I've got a career as well. Uh, you know, beyond this being my hope, my my desired career, uh, life is busy, unpredictable, messy, and so trying to like hit those goals start to become a little bit self defeating when mm -hmm. I get to a couple of days and I've not written a single word. It's like, well, now I've missed three goals and it's just backing up. Mm -hmm. It starts to feel like all those goals are now I now I have to make up for it with fifty thousand words in one day. <laughs> like, it just it felt like it becomes impossible. Yeah. Um, also, again, in, in my career in advertising, I've done a lot of, this is the geek in me, a lot of research on how does the creative brain work? Mm -hmm. How does the human brain develop creative thinking? And it can't be forced. Yeah. You can't put people in a room and say, now, come up with a great idea right now. It just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. So even if you said, I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. every day and I'm going to write a thousand words, your brain just might not be ready at 5 a.m. on a Tuesday, but it'll be fine at 6 p.m. on a Thursday. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of go with where the, your creative brain wants to take you. Um, generally, it does mean that I'm writing late at night. After my family goes to bed, I could, you know, then finish watching whatever show they fell asleep on the couch watching <laughs> and go downstairs to my to my library and sit there for at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night and, and go, 
I'm, I'm going to right now while, every, while the house is quiet and dark and it's in my own space, um, I might squeeze in a couple of hours here and there on weekends. Um, my my wife has been very supportive. Uh, mm. There was two major moments that I needed to get through when I was writing dark that she actually booked a cabin, a remote cabin in the middle of nowhere and sent me off for the weekend and said, Aww. just go, just go write, have 48 hours on your own. And I would, I'd just go away. It'd just be me, my laptop and a bottle of bourbon in an empty space. And, and I'd, I'd nail those big, those big hurdles you have to get over in the process. Oh, that's, that's awesome. That is, that's so encouraging to hear. Cause like, I know, I know for some people, like it's difficult when, when you got a family, you got obligations, you got life gets in the way, you know, and especially if, uh, you know, you know, being a full-time author isn't your career yet or anyone's career at one point, then it can become difficult to know how to balance it. And that's, that's really awesome to know that your wife supports you in that. That's so cool. My, my wife hasn't booked a cabin for me yet. I'll have to let her know <laughs> that's on the bucket list, but, uh, she, she has given me more than, more than, a, uh, I deserve amount of hours in at night where it's like, Hey, I'm not going to sleep with you tonight. I, I gotta, I gotta write this. Like it's in my mind. I gotta get it. <laughs> I, did, um, I did get to, did get to the book when, when you're at the point after you've done the, the manuscript and you've been through the editing process and all that, and you're going through then the pre-publishing phase, that was when it became crunch time. And I was, mm. I'd spent a couple of weeks where I was up until 3 a.m. every night yeah. um, and then getting up at 6 a.m., right? So minimal sleep to do my job and get back to doing this sort of stuff. But that was at the crunch point when, when it's, it's, I need to get this pre-published and published. Yeah. Um, and, and my wife would say to me, when am I going to get my husband back? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, now, when you do sit down to write, do you have a specific routine there? Or is it just like maybe you have like your epiphany moment, you know, you want to write your certain scene, you start writing it? Or do you have to uh, do you have a routine where you do research first or maybe you read a book for five minutes first or journal or anything like that? Um, no, I don't. I don't read other source material. I'll go back and read the last section that I wrote just to kind of lean myself back into the pathway that I'm in was yeah. to make sure that my writing voice doesn't change. Cause I do have, I do have a more malleable writing style. Mm. So I've been able to write fantasy and rom-com and horror. I, I'm able to adapt my writing style to suit the genre, but it makes sure that I'm, I'm fitting within the story uh, language that I've used. Um, I tend to write free form, just letting the words flow. Um, I don't just power on with a brain dump though. I stop and finesse as I go. Yeah. You know, they say, oh, just get it all out and edit later. No, I need to, I need to edit as I'm going. Mm -hmm. I need each sentence not be perfect, but not, but it can't be imperfect. Otherwise right. the, what follows after is going to be imperfect. Mm -hmm. I need, I need it to, to work because I'm also, I'm not just blurbing out the story. I'm starting to find those, those key moments. And even some of those key phrases, mm -hmm. the ones that give you the chills, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so you want to make sure that's retained or you've, you've nailed it before you get on to the next thing. So yeah, I, I don't need it to be perfect in that first draft, but I can't leave it imperfect. So I am editing as I go. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way with that. Stop. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, when I, when I sit down to write, I, I do the same thing where, um, sometimes I'll just read like the last scene I wrote. Sometimes I, I read 10 chapters, you know, I, I yeah. gotta get back into, especially if it's a, a difficult maybe turning point where my main character has to face something new and i want to i want to make sure that i am doing him justice of how he's going to face this and i i want to be like okay let me get into his head again especially for me i'm writing in first person so i i really want to make sure that i'm following this character the way that he ought to be followed so i'll sometimes i read 10 chapters of that book and then i'm like okay now i'm ready to start this scene yeah um and i do the yep. same thing with editing as i go i i uh i'll sometimes like write like free form, maybe three paragraphs or so, but then I, I always go back and I, yeah. I start yeah. like looking through it, reading it like a dozen times before I keep going and, and just tink tinkering with it a little bit here and there, making sure everything's as clean as possible before I move forward. And obviously there's still revisions, but you know, yeah. I, I'm the same way. Like I, I want it to at least look clean or it's going to bug me and you know, it's not going to, it's not going to sound right as I keep going. Well, I think it's also, it's also because we're trying to construct a, a narrative story, something that is inspiring and emotional. Yeah. As you can't just talk about, it's like when you're building a house, you don't just go, here's my bricks. And I'll just throw them over there. 
right? Because that's where the house is going and there's my bricks and I'll sort it out later. No, you need to start with the foundation and then you need to start building the framework and then you need to start putting the bricks on it and then start putting the windows in. You don't kind of just go, oh, I'll get back and do that bit later after yeah. I've got the roof. There's, a, there's an order in which has to happen so you can stand back and go, ah, it's worked out perfectly. Mm -hmm. The pieces have fitted together. Yeah, no, that's so good. Um, before I ask you the next question, I notice my screen's getting pretty dark because it's getting dark here. I'm going <laughs> to turn my ISO up just a tiny bit. Oh, there you go. Good enough. All right. Um, moving on. We got a few more. Yep. All right. Next question. How many drafts do you do for your book? Do you have a specific set? Like, I'm going to go through this book. Um, you know, first I'm going to outline it, then I'll write first draft, then I'll have maybe an alpha reader or editorial assessment done, then a second draft or, you know, and so on and so forth. Or do you just keep, keep going through it until you feel it is complete? <laughs> uh, keep going through it until you feel it's complete. Yeah, mostly. Um, I, given that I'm a detailed plotter and given my process of editing as I go, each draft is already kind of semi-polished mm -hmm. and gets more you know polished each time you're going back over it. Um, and it's, it's hard to kind of go, well, that was a draft and this is the second draft and this is yeah. the third draft because you're doing that revisions as you're going kind of thing. But I reckon there's probably it's probably three full passes beginning to end. Okay, yeah. With, with each of those, there's that written, you know, certainly that first one going back over and over and over again. Um, one of those I, I, it has to be printed out and read out loud. Mm. And so in the case of Dark, it was read out loud to my, to my daughter um, because she's my, she became my beta reader essentially. Um, and you know, proud moments when she's crying at, at, at a certain end of a certain chapter. Yes, I made my oh, daughter cry. Awesome. It's a proud moment, <laughs> and that's because that's what that chapter was meant to do. And that's when I know she's believed in this character so much that when that moment happens, she's devastated. Yeah. This is a good thing. This is good. So there was twice that that happened. Um, there was two points where she kind of almost cheered as well, going, "Yes, yes, I knew it." Um, so that's when you know you're getting those those visceral reactions mm -hmm. from an audience person. And sure, she's 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 young, and I'm her father, so she'll love what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But it was genuine reactions. But reading it, printing it out and reading it out loud, even when I'm reading it to her as a manuscript, I'm able to go through and make pencil notes and go. Even as I'm saying the words, you start you read it. You may have written a sentence and it looks fine, but when you read it out and suddenly it, you stumble over it. If you stumble over a sentence you've written, then clearly it's not. It's not right for a reader's ear. Right. So you need to restructure that. And I find that's a really good way of, of identifying where you may have flubbed a little bit. So lots of notes in the margins. You can go back and then, you know, that's that's within those first three passes. Make sure it's probably the first or second one. Um, so you've got more passes afterwards. I don't know, it's probably three, maybe four. And it went to my editor. And there was at least two more full passes after my editor um, gave for their feedback. Um, but then even after I got a... An actual published author's proof. I said, I've got it downstairs. I actually sat down and read through it cover to cover and made pencil notes in the margins of things. There'll always be some mistakes. There'll always be typos. Right. And it's no matter what program you're using, it will skip. It will skip typos, or you'll 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 misread them. Um, so it's things like that. But also just little sentences. You go, ah, oh, I can just swap these words over and read mm -hmm. better. But even after I had an author's proof, I went through and did that again and went through it. Um, to just try and get it as close as possible. There's also a point at which you have to go, if I keep doing this, I'll keep changing it. There's yeah. a point at which you have to go, it's, and it's not about it's good enough, it's about it's great enough. Right, right. Great right. enough. It's time for this to go on to the next phase. Otherwise, you will just be there for years, constantly restructuring, restructuring, restructuring. The danger of that is if you stop doing that too early, you put something out there that isn't, isn't so great. So you have to, within yourself and your own ability, understand what's the point at which you go, I can be done with this. I can, mm -hmm. I can let this move on. No, I love that. Like it, it definitely comes to a point where it's like, as humans, like it, we're, we're fallible. Like we're not going to be perfect. You know, there's always going to be, you know, even if you look at this book a year from now, two years from now, I'm sure you'll look back and be like, oh, I should have did this or I should have done that or I could have added this or I could have deleted that. But like, you know, it where it is is like you have to just get it to as perfect as possible and be confident in it you know and yeah. um yeah i i think that's awesome but yeah that's a, that's really interesting so you have a draft that you always read out loud i i like that i i did that with this last book i wish i did it with my other two books because <laughs> um i actually 
I forget I forget what the occasion was, but I was reading one of my first books that I published to somebody and I found myself stumbling over a few sentences in the one chapter and I thought to myself, man, if I read this out loud before publishing it, I wouldn't have made that mistake. Yeah. You know, I would have fixed that, which which is totally fine. That was, you know, five years ago. But with this book, I, I did the same thing. I, I made sure to read it out loud all the way through and I tried to do it all in one sitting which was really difficult. I, I got about, I think I got 60 to 70% of the way through. So I read like 40,000 words in one sitting out loud, but my jaw started clicking and I was like, okay, I need to, I need to go to sleep. It was like three in the morning and my, my mouth was getting tired just from reading out loud. <laughs> the other, the other thing I did do, and I don't, it didn't start out intentional. It was just every time you picked it up again as an author's proof and just flick to a random page, chances are you'd find something that you wanted mm. to change or even a mistake right and and as a as a closet perfectionist it, it would grate on me so much when i go christ how did i miss that how did i miss that <laughs> there's a typo how did it? right when it had been through again all the revisions i had done it had been through you know again a type in word so it's meant to tell you when there's when there's a spelling mistake and so forth you do your spell check your editor has done it your proofreader has done it but there's still stuff that gets missed right, right? Um, but what I did do is I'd pick it up and I'd just read a page. But what I ended up doing is reading the entire book, but not in order. Mm. I would read, I'd read page 291, then 290, and then 289, then 280. I read the entire thing essentially backwards, wow. page by page. And that allowed me to not focus on the story, but to focus on the words that were just fucked up. Oh, that's so interesting. I should I should try that. that that's well, a really say, interesting rule. They say that when you're proofreading, what you should do is you read the copy word for word backwards. Because hmm. now cause when, you're, when, you're, when you're reading front to back of a piece of copy, your brain is able to fill in the gaps. Right. So if there's a mistake, you might not even notice it. But if you're going backwards, certainly looking for, for spelling mistakes, you go backwards, you read the last word, then the second last word, you will notice you're seeing the word in isolation. And so you will notice the mistake. So I did that almost on a page level and noticed each mistake in the pages on isolation. Yeah, that's like uh, it's like that meme where they they spelled a word wrong um, purposefully in a sentence. And then they would be like, yeah. did you notice that this word, all the letters are in the wrong order, but you still read it the right way? Yeah. Like, but no, that's interesting. Um, so what are the hardest parts of writing for you? Just personally, what do you what do you find that you struggle with most or? Uh, maybe maybe struggle is not the right word, but something that you feel that you trip over sometimes when you're writing. Str struggle is the right word. Headspace. Mm. Just just having that headspace. I mean, everyone talks about, oh, I don't have enough time to write, or I don't have enough time to do things. Everybody has so much time available to them. Mm. What we're doing is wasting time by yes. binge watching that show, Re watching a rerun we've seen a thousand times. Right? If Seinfeld comes on, I will just be mesmerized. And if I've seen them all a thousand times, but I have to stop and watch Seinfeld, that's just wasting time. Mm -hmm. We all have plenty of time to do these things. What we need to do is prioritize them, Pro get, work out what do I really want to spend my time doing. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's the headspace, having a clear run at writing. So finding the time isn't isn't so hard. Like I say I can do it from midnight to three a.m. But the headspace, how have I felt during the day? Am I tired? Am I am I overwrought? Am I stressed out? Is my family still up and running around? Yeah, you know, what's what's going on? Um, but also fitting in that time to de-stress between my home life and work life and my writing life. Mm. So headspace headspace is the real thing. That's why you know getting away would be is is ideal. Um, I'd love to have the little shed in the down the bottom of the backyard where you just go down there and lock the doors and people know. <laughs> yeah, like this a little bunker. Time. So, yeah, I, I just know that if I had that, I would never see my family again because I just mm -hmm. lock myself in permanently. <laughs> but yeah, finding headspace, I think, is the hardest part of writing. Um, mm. I mean, even, I haven't actually written anything for about two months, but that's mostly because I'm at, at that launch point yeah. of checking and double checking and printer proofs and all that sort of stuff. And it's not just this book. You will know I've already already got the follow up book yep. um, as a, as a um, an illustrated compendium to this that comes out only ten days after the first one. Yeah. So it's been it's been quite busy in the management of all that. Yeah. And then uh, on the flip side, what would you find yeah. uh, to be the easiest uh, part of the writing uh, process for you? Whether it's something specifically to do with writing or the publishing process or just something that you feel that maybe you see other people talk about on threads or social media and say they struggle with it. And you think personally, like that comes to me, like yeah. that's a knack. Okay. Uh, well, 
I'll give you two answers. The easiest yeah. part of writing is getting on a roll. But once yeah. I start, it's kind of hard for me to stop. And so when I say I can sit down and start writing at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I might say to myself, I'm going to write until midnight. But then I look up and it's 3 a.m. Yeah. I'm going, I've got to get up in three hours. I I just, I need to stop. I have to force my, I have to tear myself away from the manuscript or from mm -hmm. the laptop. So getting on a roll is really easy for me. Um, I think the other thing when you're talking about what is it that come that I find easy that others might struggle with that I've read about in social media, formatting, um, mm -hmm. you know, actually designing and publishing and so forth. Uh, because again, my career in advertising, in design and so forth, I'm able to go to the sites and say, oh yeah, bleed, trim, margin. Yeah, I got that. I understand this file and just, you know, make the file work. Whereas I can imagine a lot of people look at that kind of information and go, what are they talking about? <laughs> what is what is this? <laughs> yeah. uh, at, least, at least that is kind of second nature to me. So in the publishing phase, and again, it's fun for me to design it because more than just obviously tapping into my design and art skills, it yeah. was my words that I'm now designing in a formatted book and so forth. Oh, yeah. Um, and and I'll even throw in here, like, the design of, like, having your first chapter black. Like, that is so cool. Like, what I've I've read one other book, I believe it was called Afterworld, that had some pages with that was black with white letters. And I think it was when – I think there was, like, a dream world in this story. So when the character was dreaming – um or no the character was an author and when they were writing their story those those uh pages were in black and yep. so i haven't but i i haven't read that since i was probably 14 15 years old so i completely forgot about people doing that and it was yeah. just like a fresh experience for me i loved that such a cool design choice well i mean when i first had the idea of this story you know 10 12 years ago I actually figured, oh, imagine if it was just all black pages with white type for the entire book. <laughs> but it, it does get hard to read after all, certainly for yeah. people who might read in bed at night, that kind of thing. Um, and then I had the idea of, oh, you do one where it's just black type and white and do a special edition that's reversed. And I found, you know, this is kind of the nice middle ground in between. Yeah. Um, it does mean, again, as a self-publisher, it can be challenging because uh, Ingram Spark won't won't do that via really? yeah, I published via draft to digital okay. which uses England Spark as well as all the other platforms. It won't let you do that. And so mm -hmm. draft to digital is for the primary paperback that will go into bookstores. Yeah. For the hardcover, I had to because draft to digital doesn't do hardcover yet, I had to go direct to Ingram Spark and that does let you do the black the black pages. Um, but Amazon does. And so the paperback that you've got is actually an Amazon published one. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that some of them just wouldn't let you do it because they, they, they're concerned about the ink weight. Mm. Uh, I can't imagine it's to do with the cost, but it might be to do with the paper thickness. Yeah. That it just increases the paper thickness by a couple of microns and screws out their machines. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I've actually heard a lot of people. So I've heard people go left and right on it and saying like, oh, Amazon's print uh, copies aren't good. And other people say, no, they're they're great. I love working with the Amazon's prints. And I I thought these these looked great. Like I, I wouldn't have known that this copy was of lower quality or anything. I, th I thought it came out great. So that's pretty cool. I, I think part of that's also, you know, I did do three different authors print proofs gotcha. from all the platforms, which, which has a cost to it, but right. just to make sure this is working out. Cause even the print proof of the paperback from Amazon was different from the one from Ingram spark. Mm. And so I had to adjust the color saturation of the, of the cover itself hmm. to suit their different print presses. Um, and then even the follow-up monster compendium, I ordered a copy printed from Amazon Australia and it's a full bleed illustrative book. And there was horrible white edges where their, their oh, trim machine man. had missed. So I thought, this is terrible. I ordered one from the States and it was perfectly fine. It just hmm. it just depends. Yeah. It can be hit and miss. You're not you're not there at the printing press yourself judging them as they come out. So you just gotta yeah. hope that they'll get it right in the day. Yeah. So any any listeners out there, make sure you get your proofs because uh as Matt Batten's Abs saying here, it's important. <laughs> Absolutely. And and yeah, if you are doing different uh, publishing um, avenues, get one from each of them. Don't just think, oh, I've uploaded the same file to both. It'll be fine because their print machines will be different. And so the colors will just be different. You, you need to you need to see it. At the end of the day, if somebody picks up your book and it feels a bit substandard, they're going to go into your story thinking that it's a substandard story. Mm, right, right. Um, 
Well, great. That is the last main question I have for Matt. Do you have anything you want to add, Matt, uh, before I get to our final rapid fire questions here? No, no, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. You go for it. Awesome. It's fantastic. All right. First, first question here. What's your favorite format to read? Uh, whether it's a uh, physical or Kindle and specifically what kind of physical, if it is physical. Hardcover. Nice. Nice. Always hardcover. Traditionalist. It's just, it just feels nice and weighty. Um, and even when I'm, I'm purchasing other books, hardcover, um, it's also, they're la longer lasting. I, I'm a mm -hmm. bookkeeper. Um, again, home library filled with books. Yeah. Um, I have a first edition of every single Terry Pratchett book, hardcover. Um, even the ones I missed, I went back and was paid a little bit of money for them, but to buy hardcover first editions of, of all of them, um, yeah, just just they look better, they feel better, um, and they last longer. No, I'm I'm the same way. I used to have so before I moved, I just moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, about eight months ago. And before I moved, I had tons of first edition hardcover Stephen King books, and yep. I had I had like a library of like 800 books. Um, and then I had to move, and I couldn't take all 800 books with me, unfortunately, um, because my wife and I agreed that we're gonna move with whatever fits in one car load. And so that was really <laughs> difficult, but selling those books did go towards the move. So, you know, yeah, <laughs> it worked out, but I'm go. sure I'll recollect them. <laughs> uh, next um, question. Just, oh, yeah, go sorry. Ahead. On, on that note, just for those out there who, who are buying and supporting indie authors, just be aware that they make almost no money out of a hardcover. Mm. Like the margin on a hardcover is so small because... Yeah. The cost of producing a hardcover book is ridiculously high mm -hmm. by comparison, um, and they can't price it to make the same margin. Otherwise, no one's going to buy the book. Um, so, if you if you really want to support them, then financially, then buy the paperback. But if you really love the hardcover and you th you see it and you go, it's a bit expensive. Understand that they're not making any money out of that anyway. Yeah, they're still they're still making no money out of a hardcover. Yeah, good point there. Good point there. Um, next question here. Do you, uh, have any last, uh, last writing advice for aspiring authors that may be listening in or even, uh, uh, young authors or new authors that are yeah. listening in? Well, we've all heard the cliche about how you never look back on your life and wish you wasted more time. Um, and that's take it from me. It's so true that I did waste 25 years dabbling in assorted writing attempts and fits and spurts before actually sitting down and going, I need to, I need to actually roll up my sleeves and do this. And I, and I, I hate myself for it every day because I, I look at what I've done in just the last three years and think, imagine where I could have been if I did this when I was 21, I first started doing it. Mm. When I first thought, Hey, I'm going to write a book. Imagine if I'd done that back then, right? I would have been 30 years ahead of where I am today. And it's, it feels like a, you know, midlife crisis, but also a gross waste of time, mm -hmm. you know, to, to lose a quarter of a century, not having done this sooner, you'll never look back in your life and wish that you'd written less. Yeah. And, and to add to that, like, uh, even from your point of view, like, uh, you know, you still have half of your life left or a quarter of your life left, whatever it is. So like to start now is still like, like it's never too late. Like start when you yeah. do, you know, that's, that's great. Um, I have, I have, I have again crunched some numbers and the, the, the number of story ideas I have in, because I keep me with notes in my phone, yeah. the number of story ideas I have, I could never possibly get through writing them all in my lifetime. <laughs> yeah. I, I, less, right? I don't understand when I look at some of these authors like uh, Agatha Christie, Steve, uh, Stephen King, or James Patterson, some of these authors that have published 70 plus stories in their life i'm like what in the world how how did they do that full-length novels too like what the heck well it, it's also the time and place right so mm -hmm. agatha christie was able to do it because she was in a space as one of the only female writers writing you know mystery murder mysteries and so forth and you know it was also a, a, a era where it wasn't there wasn't many hoops to jump through i'm not saying right. she was a, terrorist, she's a fantastic writer but it made it later easier for her to go i've got another story and the publisher would go thank you we're printing it there's none of checking there's no going backwards and forth these days for again for people who want to go the traditional route even if you it's manage so to tough. have a good manuscript that gets an agent it could still be five to eight years before that book comes out yeah and like that's that, 
Yeah, that's, that's where, a massive waste of your life. Yeah, that's that's where I'm at. Like that's why I'm not uh, going with a large publishing company. I'm with I am I am signed by a small publishing company, but like they're small enough where it's like, hey, I can I can literally say to them, hey, can I publish my book in seven months from now? Like yeah. that's when I want it published, and they say, yeah, we'll make it happen. You know. Whereas yeah. if I was with one of the you know Big Five or the Trad, like how cool it is to be published by them, but at the same time, it's like. I might not see my book out for two years and they want to see how that one does before they sign me for another contract, you know? Yeah. So it's like, and, and your other example, Stephen King, he hit the market at the time when horror became the new thing, but also the way he was doing horror, it was yeah. very, very elevated horror. Yeah. And so it, it found essentially its own new space to operate in. And so it was very easy for him to just keep going the next story, next story. And so have so many books go out there. Um, and also I guess, once you get to that point, right, once he had Carrie picked up and turned into a film and so forth, he's, he's now made it into Hollywood mm -hmm. and he's making lots of money. And so he's able to sit back. He's able, he doesn't have to worry about where the money's coming from. He can devote his time to do it, whereas a lot of us are still juggling mm -hmm. all these other things, right? Um, yeah. So it's very easy. It would be very easy to churn out 70 to 100 books if you started at the age of 20 and found fame by the age of 25. Right, right. And I know I... Uh... Um, I, I listened to an interview with Stephen King where uh, it was from like it was one of his interviews from like 2005 or something. So really old interview. Um, but he was saying in his interview how um, they asked him, how how are you? They I, I think they said you put out two books this year. How'd you do that? How'd you write two books this year? And he's like, well, I, I average six to seven thousand words a day. So and he's like, yeah. sometimes I write. Uh, I have two writing sessions. So then that day I'll put out 20, 12,000 words. Yeah. And obviously like he goes through his own drafts and stuff, but like, yeah, yeah. he's a, he's a fast writer. <laughs> the, the flip side of that is, is a warning, right? It's, it's a watch out because I had, I did see somebody post on threads how they'd, they'd self published something like six books in the last seven months. Wow. And that, and that to me was a concern because mm -hmm. it sure if they had within that time written and published those books, and I'm not saying maybe they spent the ten previous ten years. If they spent the previous ten years writing them mm -hmm. and then rapid fire publish them, fine. But if they were writing and publishing at that rate, that's very it concerns, quick. It concerns me about the quality of the craft they're applying. Now, again, I don't, I don't know who it was, but yeah. it's just one of those things that you kind of go, oh, as indie writers, we also have a bit of a responsibility to help the whole indie division of writing mm -hmm. elevate. Um, and I think we've all done it. We like supporting indie writers and we've yeah. all purchased indie writing books. And sometimes you get one, you go, Oh, it just needed, it just needed a bit more. It just needs. Yeah. And I think the, while it's great to support the indie writers, what you, what, what is happening. And we, we, we talk about every now and then on threads, Oh, why aren't the traditional publishers afraid of, of indie publishing? And that's why, mm. because there aren't those checks and balances. And so they, they don't see indie publishing as a threat because can get i don't want to say saturated but it can be hit and miss in terms of the quality of the books and therefore the audience might, um now we've all also gone to a bookstore and purchased a book from a traditional publisher and read it and gone this is shit yeah so it happens on the other side as well mm -hmm. i think it's it's on all of us to make sure we are trying to elevate the entire industry not yeah. just our own yeah i agree 100 percent because i even like uh in the past few months, I've been trying to read more indie myself, and sometimes I read an indie book where it's like, it doesn't seem like they had an editor go through this, or this this looks like yeah. a this seems like a first draft. And like, I don't I don't say that to offend anybody or to no. uh, it, you know, like it, it's fine. Like it is a big achievement to write a book, huge but, achievement, um, you know. But like as a as a writing coach, someone who works with drafts over and over and over with people, like I could just tell, I could see it. Um, and some people, um, when they're, when they're young in the industry, when they're first, um, getting into writing, like they're, they're excited, you know, and they, they want to jump the gun. Um, yeah. even with, I was telling my wife the other day, looking back at the first two books I published, like, it, like today, if I had the decision, I wouldn't have published those books because <laughs> I am so much more prouder of the book that's coming out now versus those two. But at the same time, like I had to learn, I was excited and I wanted to write those books and yeah, they were edited thankfully, but like. They are not up to the quality of my writing today. So anytime someone reads my old books, like when they say they like it, I always tell them, well, you'll really like the next one then because those were not the best quality out there. But um, well, I, I think, <laughs> I think, I, I think, well, I think 
even with what you're saying there, even with the lens of what we're talking about of mm -hmm. trying to make sure you're, you're putting something out there that's as good as it can be, again, you know, when, when we are talking about indie authors, it'd be great if those who are reading and reviewing also had that lens of, well, this is an indie author who doesn't have a proofreader and and not just an mm -hmm. editor, usually a team of editors and a proofreader and a developmental editor. They don't have all that right. supplied for them. They're having to do this on their own back or have a friend do it for them, that kind of stuff. So you do have a little bit of allowance, a bit of tolerance, mm -hmm. right? Don't yeah. just slam and going, oh, there was a typo on page 23 and right. therefore this book is terrible. Like, come on. Yeah. Right? Acknowledge the fact that this is, a, a, an indie author, whether it be first or second time, maybe if it's 10th time, mm -hmm. their craft should be there. Like they should develop it. I mean, even Terry Pratchett, you read the very first um, books, Color of Magic and Light Fantastic, and they're not as great mm -hmm. as the later ones in the series because yeah. you're still finding his feet within that universe. Um, but, yeah, don't slam an author for their first time around for sure. Yeah. Um, authors need to try their best. Readers need to also like an allowance for that, um, certainly in the indie space, because we, we are up against some some big guns. Um, and I think in that sense, it'll it'll allow the indie authors to learn and craft and do more, uh, rather than they put one out and get slammed for it and go, that's it, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, and then last, last question here. Um, do you have any goals, um, whether it's in life or in writing, um, that you want to put out there so that we can all hold you to it? <laughs> <laughs> well, plenty, plenty of goals. I mean, you know, midlife crisis will, will, will rear up all those goals. Um, but if, if it's in terms of this as a pursuit, um, what you know, we all want to see our books on bookstores. We want to, you know, I'd love to you'd see it, you know, get film options. You know, I'd love to be able to take my daughter and her friends to the cinema to see one of my books turn into a film. We'd all love that. Yeah. But for me, it's there's a story I read about uh, Jeffrey Archer, who who some might hate because he did some bad things. But there's a story I read about him in an interview where he was on a flight once. And he sat down on his plane and next to him, as the plane takes off, the passenger next to him had pulled out a book to read. It was one of his books. Wow. And like to just have that moment where you're seeing somebody read your book. In his story, he actually asked the guy, oh, what's that book like? And the guy went, oh, it's okay. It's not one of his best. I think this, this, this. <laughs> Jeffrey Archer never revealed that he was Jeffrey Archer, that he was the author. Oh, my what he goodness. Did do is he, is he waited until that gentleman had gone to the bathroom or something and then he signed the book and then put it back in the guy's um, seat pocket and he just left the flight, just thinking one day that guy's going to open his book and look at it and go, this is autographed. Oh, no. I told <laughs> Jeffrey Archie his book sucked. I would love to have a moment like that where I'm sitting next to somebody and even if they did tell me that they didn't like the book so much, it would be great to just have to just know it's there and yeah. you've encountered it in the wild. No, that that is that is a cool goal to have. I I love how unique it is. I I hope that I hope that you do run into a stranger that's reading your book, and yeah. hopefully they're not tearing it apart. But <laughs> yeah, sit, sit down to strike up a conversation. Oh, what's that like? <laughs> but well, Matt, it has been awesome to hear you talk about just uh, some of your writing process and some of your uh, creative aspirations and inspirations and. Just uh, everything going on with you. And uh, yeah, do you have any final shout outs you want to give, whether it's um, to uh, family or your book or whatever it is? Like, let us let us know. Yeah, my family gets a dedication in the front of the book. <laughs> um, they, they have been very supportive. I would say there's been a lot of connections that I've made on threads. And, mm. you know, being the new platform, it's been quite amazing. I'm actually, I think a lot of us are quite gobsmacked by it. That I've been able to go in just, the, just this last week, I went from, a reply to somebody's thread to a Zoom call with them within 15 minutes. Wow. With somebody I'd never met on the far side of the world. We chatted for 45 minutes and then followed up with an email. So because it just it feels like it's a it's a platform that has allowed a community to form and those connections to happen and real connections. Mm -hmm. Sure, there's a lot of people on there who are not participating. They're the silent lurkers and so forth. But if you get in there and you get involved, you will find people who are your people and yeah. you'll be able to connect with them in the real world. Um, there's another writer, a poet writer, um, who has moved to Australia just recently from South Africa. And, uh, you know, so we're ready to catch up for a cup of coffee, right, in oh, the real so world. Cool. So Threads is the platform that's getting people to get to meet in the real world. So I'm loving that. Uh, I would suggest 
get in there, participate. Don't be a dick about it, but just you'll find your people and connect. You'll find with a, within the hundreds, if not thousands of followers and connections you have, there might be 50 that you mm-hmm. have a genuine connection with. So foster those because those can become your writing community and there might even be some who live in your area. Um, second to that is my book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. You know, Got to, got to pump the book. I'm very excited about it. It does come out in just a matter of days, 10th of April. Um, you can, you should be able to order it um, at a bookstore, at all bookstores. Um, but Amazon, of course, if you want to get the special dark edition with the black pages, um, you can get the hardcover if you want. Like I said, I'm making no fucking money out of that, but it'll look good on your shelf. Um, the the reality is. Just need to get need to get the numbers there, right? Yeah. I've had friends and family say, "Oh, can you give me a copy?" And I was like, "I'd love to give you a copy, but I need it to be logged in a system somewhere that there's a purchase." Yep, yep. I'm the same way. I have people saying, "So, do I get a special discount because I go to your church, or do I get a special discount because I'm family?" And I'm like, "I'm sorry, nobody gets a special discount unless yeah. you're you're paying for for it somewhere else." <laughs> well, I have I have said to my family, I, you know, an extended family, saying. Buy it on Amazon, and I'm gonna reimburse you the money. I'll give you the money. Yeah, back. yeah. <laughs> as long as it's logged as a purchase, is what we want, right? That's, yeah. That's the sort of stuff that is going to help because the algorithm is going to pick up on that and push it further. So yeah. yeah. So that's 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 the shout out. If you're interested, Dark and the Boy in the Hole, anti hero fantasy, first in a planned series. Michael loves it. It's yeah. had really good reviews so far. There's a lot of uh, five stars, a couple of four stars, but some really good reviews um, that have come through for it. So, yeah, fingers crossed. Hope you get it. Hope you like it. And uh, you can find find me at, you know, mabatten.com and, you know, connect with me there if you want. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, like I said, even, even people that don't read a lot of fantasy like myself, like you might still enjoy it, I would really highly recommend checking it out. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time, Matt. And uh, awesome. Yeah, I uh, I hope we get to do another conversation again. Maybe maybe once you publish your next book. <laughs> well, so yeah, next time because you're East Coast. Next time I'm in New, I'm in New York, we'll we'll hook up, have a coffee. Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so a- much, Chris, and uh, thanks to all the listeners. Yeah, absolutely. And I will uh, I'll uh, catch you uh, in the next video. Yeah. See you later. See ya. So that is the interview with Matt Bat, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, please leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel. I plan on having more interviews like this in the future, along with all the other writing content and uh, just uh, reading through my writing journal and stuff like that. Um, I re- I've been really loving all of the feedback I've been receiving recently. I've had quite a bit of love recently, so appreciate that. And as I said in the announcement, if you want to check out You've Got the Wrong Guy, um, you can follow me on my socials to get more updates on it, but you can also... Follow me on buymeacoffee.com slash Michael James, and you can support me in this endeavor of uh, being a full-time content creator slash writing coach slash author. Um, I really appreciate everyone that supports me over there, and um, I'm excited to do this giveaway for Buy Me a Coffee, a signed copy. So uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.